soon. Okay, so once again, this will be the week uh, uh, seven lecture. And unfortunately that we're going to have uh, three, three Mondays are going to be missing uh, from the timetable because uh, we are going to have uh, student back next week. The week after is going to be the uh, Easter holiday. And the week after we have another holiday. I don't know which holiday exactly, but anyway, you're not going to see me for three weeks uh, on row, uh, but we will try to make something to replace uh, uh, the lecture session we have because uh, we still have uh, two assignments need to go, uh, two active assignments need to go, which are the assignment number uh, three and the assignment number four. Assignment number four consists of two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be the quiz we are going to run today, and the second part is going to be about the pneumatic system. Uh, you know my policy that uh, uh, no submission required unless if I get to run a tutorial for this uh, question. So uh, I hope by this week we are going to be able to run the tutorial for the assignment number three. Uh, but the due date actually has been pushed. It's not going to be this uh, week. It's going to be after two weeks. Um, who's the person who asked me, uh, advised me actually, I, I, I admit. There's a person who advised me to push the the due date, and I did already. So I'm going to share now my screen, show you the Canvas page, uh, including everything we had, uh, uh, all the changes I had on my uh, Canvas page so far. So I will start showing my screen, and what you can see here is the Canvas page. And in the Canvas page, I will go to the assignments, and in the assignment, <coughs> actually, that's what the student will see. OK, so uh, what we are going to have as the upcoming assignments is going to be the assignment number uh, four, uh, question number one. And this will start today at eight. It's going to be available for you today by 8 p.m. It's going to be last for uh, one hour, 15 minutes. I can extend that actually if you are going to need an extra time. It's going to carry 10 points. The second question of uh, this assignment is going to be due on the 24th of April. Uh, is a pneumatic system, and once again, I'm going to give you an in um, a tutorial about this one. I'm going to send you a video tutorial first, and uh, later, if you have any question, write down this question, and we're going to have a live session at a time. Okay, even if you would like to do it during this student vac, I know that many of you will be traveling, but I'm going to be more than happy to run a one-to-one -one session, or even if I'm going to have it as small groups, <coughs> this will be okay with me. The uh, assignment number three is going to be due on 24th. By finishing these uh, sessions, this one is going to be ticked now, and these 24, we're going to have another final assignment. And the final assignment is going to be uh, for today uh, lecture, uh, the screw conveyor. And the next lecture is going to be about the pocket elevator design. I think that I'm going to simplify the um, the build conveyor design, but anyway, we'll see on time. If I get to have time to <clears throat> uh, go with the conveyor build uh, design in, in details, then uh, we'll be able to do it. Otherwise, I'll try to make it as simple as possible for you so you can know what the different types of the screw conveyors, uh, the selection of the different materials, sorry, and uh, a selection of the uh, other components we have for the system. And uh, what will be the type of the roller we are going to choose or the build we are going to choose based on the material we are going to convey. Away from that, today's session is going to be mainly about what we call the screw conveyor. And I think that many of you know what the screw conveyor is. Uh, maybe you saw it somewhere uh, through your life, but uh, maybe you, you hadn't had your hand on it. But when I'm going to show you some videos and some photos, uh, is going to explain to you uh, what this system is look like. So let me start first with the screw conveyor uh, lecture. I'm going to uh, start the slide here. Just give me one second. Okay. Uh, and share the screen again. Okay, I'll try to make it uh, short, easy, simple. 
And uh, that's what I always believe in when, when I do uh, teaching. I don't want to make the things quite complicated and the student feel scared about uh, the design procedure. So as we did with the hydraulic system, I just simplified as much as I can, uh, reduce all the steps to 11 steps that anyone can uh, follow and fin finalize the design. We're going to do a similar method in the screw conveyors and the uh, bucket elevator later. So uh, there are too many methods on designing the effort follow to be designed the screw conveyor. The one which I believe in, well, actually something like, well, I, I'm not going to say I believe in it's going to be something exact, right? But it's the, the system that, uh, the design standard that they like is going to be the SEMA, the CEMA, which is the American standard. Uh, even if you look for uh, something like European, you will find that actually they're going to use the pound and the and the foot uh, for design procedure. B because I think that most of the design procedure for the Secru Conveyor actually were built on the SEMA. So <clears throat> I uploaded this document for you. So it's written here is not for distribution, but actually I'm not selling that. I just try to help the student to understand on how to do the design procedure for the screw conveyors. So uh, yeah, this will be given to you and an extra material on the canvas. Actually, you can find it available on the canvas page. I'm going to show you that, uh, I'll show you where you can find it. So if you're going to go for the modules and you go to the module of the week number seven, uh, week seven, seven, seven. Okay, uh, you will find that I, uh, upload the uh, file here. Also for the um, material required for the assignment today, uh, you will find uh, uh, this file. All the chart, uh, I send it to you actually through a team, so also you can find it here. Okay, a lecture slide is already available for you, then we're going to go through it step by step. So if I get to minimize this slide. We're going to go for the uh, lecture number seven. So let's have a look to the uh, screw conveyor. Uh, now this will be considered as the third uh, conveying system you will uh, learn to design in this subject. We learned the pneumatic system first. We learned about the uh, hydraulic system. And now we are going to come to the screw conveyors. As I told you later, we're going to learn about the uh, pocket elevator. And finally, we're going to finish the uh, the conveyor system uh, with the uh, built conveyors. Remember that the discrete uh, conveying system is not going to be for the bulk material most of the time. So uh, the screw conveyors from the name that's going to use the screw effect within the cylinder and start to move the material to the, the screw movement. So uh, the screw conveyor is transport of the material along a tube by means of the screw. So this is the tube. We're going to have the motor. Motor is going to turn the screw. The screw will use both the action of the uh, movement of the screw and the fraction between the screw and the material to carry the material to the uh, other end. The screw conveyor can be used uh, inclined like this sh uh, figure. This can be used horizontally and can be used vertically. The design of the horizontal is going to be different from the inclined and the vertical type because the power required to move the material in different inclination is going to be different values. And we're going to come to, to that through the design procedure we're going to cover. So they are able to convey a wide range of the bulk materials which have a good flow volatility. This will be an important because the action of the screw will push the material along the bottom of the slides of the trough or the pipe housing it. The material will shear and templates forward as the screw flight continue to rotate. In some application, Screw conveyor can be used for the mixing operation as well. So you can see in these two photos, um, let me use a laser pointer. Okay, you can see that we are going to add two materials and we are going to mix the materials in this screw conveyor. 
Now you will see that the shape of this screw is going to be different from the one which is only for transported the material. It's going to have these things we call the paddles. Okay, the paddles is going to helping for the mixing of the materials. So we said we can operate the uh, screw conveyors horizontally, and inclined and vertically. The benefit of the inclined orientation is that one less conveyor needed to be used. Oh, by the way, I need to um, inform you about something very important. Usually when we connect the motor to the screw conveyor, we're always going to have a reduction system. Sometimes we're going to use a double reduction system. Because the motor itself is going to be run at high RPM, but having low torque. So to increase the torque, we're always going to use a reduction system. It can be a gearbox, it can be belt and pulleys, it can be gears, okay? but the load is not going to be on the motor directly. The screw conveyors can be also adopted very readily to discharge the material from the pins and the hoopers, and this obligation known as the screw feeders. So as the, the screw conveyor can be connected at the bottom of the pins and the hoopers, and then start to feed, the, uh, feed, feed with the material, and it's going to move it and feed the material to the application at constant rate. That's what we call the screw feeders. The screw conveyor com components are going to be, the most important thing is going to be the screw itself. Within the screw, we're going to have the drive shaft. The drive shaft is going to connect the screw. And of course, this will be connected to the motor or the gearbox and the motor. Sir, you have gone on mute. You are mute. Since when I was muted? Like a minute ago, <laughs> not uh, not too far. Can anyone mute me? That that's that's the question I always keep asking myself because I'm looking at this slide, not looking at the at the teams. Can anyone mute me? Uh, we don't think so. I think they can actually. Oh. I'll try. Okay. Yeah, I can. Okay, so don't mute me, please. <laughs> I don't know how to uh, prevent the people from muting me, but uh, I'm going to ask you not to mute me again. Anyway, so uh, I'll start once again with the components of the of the screw conveyor. We, the most important thing is going to be the uh, screw itself is going to be connected or the drive shaft. And the drive and the screw conveyor from both ends is going to be con uh, hanged with bearings, special types of bearings that is going to have the uh, the the seal to prevent the material to go between the uh, two rings of the bearings and the and the bolts. Um, we also have uh, well, that's not going to be uh, uh, we don't want to have to be suspended and uh, bending from the middle. So we are going to have this part. We are going to have this pushing here, and number seven, which is going to be the hanger bearing, and it's going to be uh, fixed to the uh, part number six, which is going to be the hanger. The hanger will su support the bearings from the uh, middle. Um, the material need to have a cover from the sides in order to uh, run the material between the screw conveyor uh, uh, parts and and the and the cover. The cover here is this shape. We call it the trough. Usually they call it the trough. I don't know what they call it here. Number eighteen. Uh, they yeah, it's troughs. Okay, so we have the troughs. You can see the trough is going to be connected of. Uh, it's going to be length of different troughs, different length to have the uh, standard to, to have the length. Usually we have a standard length for the troughs, which is going to be something about uh, three feet each. Uh, Sometimes we're going to use a cylindrical shape, and this will be uh, useful in case if we're going to have it for the vertical system. But for the horizontal system and the sometimes the inclined system, we're going to have it as a trough for the possibility of removing the cover, which is number 16, 
Okay, number five, sorry, uh, what they call it? Decover, yeah? Remove the cover and make some maintenance for the system. Of course, we're going to have inlets and we're going to have the outlets. Uh, number two is going to be, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be connected to the motor or the reduction system before the motor. Anything else is going to be just uh, some of the accessories required to make the system work without any problems. Now, the advantage of the screw conveyor, first, they are compact. That means if you're going to assemble it, you can move it around. It's not going to have any possibility for uh, the assemble due to the vibration. So they have modular design, so it's going to be easy for ins uh, by to installation. Simple supports, high temperatures can be uh, taken, easily hermetics, extremely versatile. Uh, distance can be up to 50 meters continuously. Several loadings and unloading points are possible. So if I get to take a look to this one, I can have multiple outlets through the screw conveyor, it can feed multiple processes. Also, I can have multiple inlets in the case if I would like to mix multiple materials or in case if I get to connect the screw conveyor line to a multiple hoopers. The screw can be right-handed or left-handed. You can see the difference between them, just like the screw uh, we have or the bolts we have, we also have the right-handed and left-handed. Uh, so, uh, usually uh, it's going to be depending on the form of the helix we are going to have inside. So you can see this one is going to go for the clockwise direction, while this one is going to go for the counterclockwise direction. The direction of the helix is in which way the screw we need to rotate in order to move the material the proper direction. The screw hand can be determined by looking at the end of the screw. Take a look at the screw. See the helix is going to be going clockwise. This will be the right-handed. If it's going to be going counterclockwise, this will be left-handed. Okay, so actually that's what it's explaining here. I just made it as uh, simple words. The different types of the screw can be one, any one of these uh, different uh, shapes you, have, you see in the front of you. Each one have a different application. But the most appropriate application is going to be just moving the material through the screw conveyor. So if we're going to take a look to this one, this will be the standard sectional flight screw. This is the most common one used to convey the material uh, with a wide variety of the products. In one second, I got a message from a student. No, it's not going to be important now. Okay, now the other type is what we call the ribbon flight screw. This one is going to be used, this type, is going to be used to convey the sticky, gummy, or vicious uh, substances. Or if you are going to have the material that tend to stick to the flighting uh, at the pipe, it's going to be connected here. So this one is going to be always cleaning the, the the wall of the pipe that hosting the uh, screw and also is going to push the material in between here. The color fly screw, this type, uh, is going to be conveying a light, fine granule and the flaky materials. Also used to mixing all the materials in the transient uh, or for the removing of the grit and the dirt from the grain, uh, cotton seeds and extra. The other type is the cut and folded fly screw. You can see that this one is going to be similar to the cut fly screw, but it's going to have some of the uh, paddle is going to be folded. You can see it's folded in this direction to the backward. So it's going to be used to create a lifting motion with the material that promotes aggregations and the aerations while mixing. Now this will be the section of the fly screw with the paddles. You can see these paddles. Okay, now this way this one is going to be used to mix the material. Whatever you're going to have, uh, the name paddles and the screw conveyor. That means that the main purpose is going to be uh, the mixing while uh, the conveying. The paddles may be fixed uh, uh, or adjustable pitch uh, to provide different degrees of mixing. Usually it's going to be fixed in and we use the screw to screw it in the, on the main shaft. Uh, the paddle screw, this doesn't have actually the Screws only have the paddles. It's used to complete mixing of the string of the materials. 
and the pedal may be fixed or adjustable pitch to provide the variable degrees of mixing. Uh, this one is going to be the short pitch screw, and this one is going to be used mainly in the any client uh, or the Hoover fed applica applications where the pitch is going to be less than the diameter of the screw. The interrupted fly screw, uh, as you can see in this one, is going to be used for conveying the sticky, the gummy efficient substances or when the material tend to stick to the fly thing at the pipe. Uh, now, this one is going to have a multiple uh, uh, screw value. It's going to have the short and the wide at the end. We call it the cone screw. It's used to provide a better mass flow from the hooper or the pin above than the screw with the variable pitch alone. The shaftless screw is similar to the robot screw, used for the conveying of the sticky or the gummy or the fissure substances and preventing the heavy materials to be stick on the main shaft here. We have the press screw, and this typically is going to be surrounded by the screen and used to press the moisture from the various products. Uh, I think that if anyone used the plastic injection machine, you will have similar to these screws inside. Mainly, it's going to be a mixing between the cone screw and the press screw. Now, regarding the drive and, and the coupling hangers and the bearing shaft and the coupling bolts. So at the end of each uh, shaft screw, uh, we are going to have the connecting shaft, like this one. It's going to connect it inside the main shaft by using the bolts and nuts, as you can see here. And, and because it's going to have a long shaft, we, to prevent the bending, we're going to use the hangers. The hanger is going to have the uh, pushes, we call the bearing as well, which is going to keep the shaft rotating without any high friction, and also is going to hold uh, support it in the middle to prevent any buckling uh, for the shaft. The troughs, the covers, and the trough supports. Usually we are going to have troughs, sometimes we use it without any covers. If I'm going to have material that's going to cause uh, something like a dusty, uh, uh, substances, then we need to have the covers. So the trough itself can be the flange one, can have an angle of flange cover, can be the flared trough, is going to more look like V instead of U shape. We can have the drop bottom trough, and we can have the channel side trough. For the covers, we can have it just a plain cover, we can have the semi flange covers, and we can have the flange covers, and finally we have the shots. For the supports, which are going to be sitting below there, we can have the support feet and we have the support saddle. Support feet usually is going to be sitting at the end here. Support saddle is going to be sitting at any position uh, of the trough. The inlets. The most common type of the inlet is going to be the rounded inlet support. We can have it as directly feeding the screw, like this scenario or we can have it as uh, the uh, multiple stage. Usually this is going to be used to control the amount of the material to be uh, sub, uh, supplied to the system. We had the flector plate inlet. Now, once again, this will slow down the rate of the feeding by passing it through the multiple plates inlets. We can have the side inlet, and we can have the hand si slide inlet gates which are going to have multiple inlets for the system. Now for these ties, we're going to have this slide uh, gate. So we can close it and open it, and this can be done by hand. The discharge spouts, and as I mentioned earlier, that usually the, outside, the outlet is going to be at the bottom. So if I'm going to have just continuously feeding the system without, having, without need for any control for the, uh, for the outlet, I'm going to use the plain discharge opening. I can use the discharge spout, which is going to have a square shape, and in that case, this can be a feeding the system directly, or it can be used to fill bags, for example. I can have the rack and the pinion curved uh, slide gates. Uh, this will have a gate to be open and close, or I can have the rack and the pinion flat slide gate. As this will close type, and this will be at the opening position. It will be gate, and I will be controlling what will be the amount of the material I need to feed to my process. 
the trough ends and we said this will be usually supporting the shaft and we're going to have the bearing sitting at after the trough ends this can have a different shape depending on the trough shape and uh, this actually going to have the um, the double roller bearings at the end and this will be required to uh, actually uh, having the connection to the motor at this spot now the design preparation design preparation will be ensuring that there will be a full understanding of the material that need to be conveyed different materials is going to have a different design procedure for them the steps are going to be the same but the density the particle size the flowability and the and the uh, rootedness of the material will decide what will be the trough we are going to use or the bearing we are going to use or the diameter of the screw we are going to select so um, first we need to have some design preparation uh, by changing everything from the SI unit uh, to the IP units so I gave this table in the lecture slide that you can use it in, when, while you're doing your assignments uh, while you're doing your final exam or when you're going to work in the field you always need to know how to change between the different parameters now the most important thing for us that we need to know that every one centimeter sorry every one uh, uh, inch is equal to 25 centimeters so we can go forward and backward from there you can find the cubic centimeter in the cubic inch the cubic into the cubic centimeter this will be conversion factors letter to the cubic feet the cubic feet to liters the cubic feet to cubic inches cubic feet to bushless the bushless to the cubic feet liter to the gallons the gallons to the liters the cubic inches to the gallon the gallons to the cubic inches the cubic feet to the gallons the cubic yard to the cubic feet more for the weight what well, the kilogram to the pounds well, I think you need to remember that that every one kilogram, so every one pound is equal to 450 uh, point four five uh, kilograms or 450 grams. Uh, we have multiple terms in the United States, like the short ton and long ton and the metric ton. So, of course, the metric ton is going to be equal to 2,204 uh, pounds because it's going to be 1000 kilograms for the short ton it's going to be having 2000 pounds the long ton is going to be having 2240 pounds so of course the long ton is going to be equal to the metric ton for the linears you can see the difference between the inches and the millimeters millimeter to the inches meter to the inches and the feet to the meters and the meters to the feet for the power, uh, we have the kilowatt in the SI and is going to be horsepower in the United States. So the only thing you need to do is multiply by 1.34 or uh, if you would like to change from horsepower to the kilowatt, you multiply by 0.75 or 750 watts. OK, so that's that's actually what we have uh, between the horsepower electric and horsepower metric and uh, for the horsepower and the foot pounds per second okay well foot pounds per second is something like the joule but it's going to be in horsepower so usually we have tables and this table we call the cursor table for the material if i get to go for the document i shared with you earlier At the end of this tape, ah, here it is. Uh, here we are going to find the material classification codes. For every material, it's going to give me the uh, density, the flowability, the abrasiveness, and other miscellaneous properties or hazards. So I think we talked about this one in the first lecture when we criticized the material depending on their properties. So the density is going to be either bulk density or the loose density. Usually, this next one is going to be in pounds per cubic feet. For this size, we had the range 
between the A200 for the very fine down to the irregular we denote by E. For the flowability, one for the very flowing materials. And for four is going to be sluggish. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I think that. Uh, yep. And uh, the oppressiveness uh, for the tail from five to seven. And finally, we have some missing properties for the hazards like the flammability or generating of the static electricity and so on. So I don't accept, uh, I don't want you to, to minimize all that, but uh, you have to know it because in the future, uh, when you're going to see the code of the material, you need to uh, translate it into what does this mean, uh, this code mean. Um, now the table for the materials can be found here. Uh, yeah, this can be here, found here, the material characteristics. So in this table, you will be given first the loose bulk density. Sometimes we're going to have a range for that. If you're going to have a range for that, for design safety, you take the maximum. Or you can take the average, it's up to you. In the example we're going to have today, I just use the minimum, but just an example. Okay, so the density here is given by pound per cubic feet for different materials. So in the assignment, I'm not going to tell you uh, what the uh, material properties are. I'm going to give you the name, and you can find it from this table. Here we have the SEMA material code. This code is actually based on these parameters we just saw earlier in this table. So it's going to tell you the size of the particle, the flowability, and other properties. The component series, and this will be mainly for the for the bearings. And we have the material factor. And the V is going to be something miscellaneous, and I'm going to uh, use it here. So in the example, we're going to, come to, we're going to come to this table and tr try to find some properties and use it in our design procedure. You can see actually that this list is quite long because it have every different materials that uh, can be used with the screw conveyors. Okay. Now, that's the extract of the uh, table we saw earlier, and we are going to see how we are going to use these properties. Okay, now, once again, this is the extract from the same table we just saw above. So table number two is shown the first column is the range of the density that usually experience in the handling materials. The material table is a guide only and the material code and the material factor, the FM here, are going to be based on the experience of the several conveying manufacturers. Maybe if you're going to use another standard, you will find different FM value. But the one I'm going to use is going to be this one, which based on the SEMA uh, standard. Now, depending on the material we're going to convey, we are going to have a percent of the trough loading. This can start by filling only 15% of the trough. Up to 30%, we have 30% A and B. And this will demand on the material we're going to convey. We can have up to 45% and sometimes 95%. Once again, this will depend on the characteristics of the material. Some of the material, if it's going to be filled by more than 30%, it's going to create some 40 uh, effect. So you can see that the material will covering everything and thus it's going to start to push back the material instead of pushing forward. For the fine materials, it's going to be okay to fill by 95%. So first we start with the selection of the conveyor size and the speed of this conveyor. We first need to find what will be the maximum lump size of this material. 
then this allowable size of the lump of the screw is going to be a function of the radiate clearance between the outside diameter of the central pipe and the radius of the inside of the screw trough. So you can see that if we are going to have different screw diameters, different pipe out di outside diameter, radiate clearance will be increasing, and then we're going to have different in class depending on the lump percentage. Class number one, when we're going to have 10% lumps, the ratio R is going to be 1.75. The maximum lump size in inches are going to be starting from one and a quarter inches up to six inches. Class number two, we're going to have it as 25% lumps, so the ratio is going to be uh, 2.5, and the maximum lump size is going to be starting from three quarter of the inch up to three and three quarters. Class number two with 95% lump ratio, the R value is going to be equal to 4.5, and the maximum lump size in inches start from half inches up to two and half inches. I put this table for you just in case if you would like to use it in your design procedure. So in order to determine the size and the speed of the screw conveyor, it's necessary first to establish the material code number. And we can get that from the code number tables. This code number would control the cross-sectional loading that should be used. The capacity table below will give you the capacities in cubic feet per hour at one revolution per minute for the various size and various cross-sectional loadings. The basis for the volume capacity table is as follows. The QV Actually, they, how they calculated the, the value for the capacity for a cubic uh, feet per hour per RPM is using this equation. The QV is equal to 0.7854 multiplied by the diameter of the pipe square minus the diameter of the screw uh, square multiplied by the pitch screw value in inches distance between the screw teeth and multiplied by the K, which is the percentage of trough loading, multiplied by 60, divided by 1,728. The table we came through for the conveyor speed is going to use this equation. The RPM value for the conveyor speed is going to be equal to the flow rate, required volumetric capacity in feet per, uh, cubic feet per hour, multiplied by multiple factors. We start with the CFO, which is the conveyor, uh, sorry, the yeah, CFO is the overload capacity factors, which is a safety factor that range between 110 to 120%. We have the CF1, which is the conveyor pitch factor, the CF2, which is the type of the flight factor, CF3 is going to be the mixing battle factor if I can have any. Divided by the C1, which is going to be the conveyor capacity at one RPM and I'm going to show you how we can find this value from tables. Now to find the value for the CF1, CF2, and CF3, <coughs> we're going to use these tables. First, for the standard pitch value, uh, we're going to use the CF1, the CF1 to be equal to one. If I'm going to use the short pitch, that means that the distance between the screw is going to be quite small, I'm going to uh, have the value for the CF1 to be equal to one half. For the half pitch value, I'm going to have the value for CF1 is equal to 2. For the long type, I'm going to use the CF1 equal to 0.67. For the special conveyor flight capacity factor of the CF2, this will depend on the conveyor loading. Are we going to have 15%? Well, i show you that in photos. It's going to be 15%, 30%, or 45%. If I'm going to have the cut flight, the value for the CF1 will be ranged between 1.95 for the 15% up to 1.34 for the 45 percent For the cut and the floated uh, uh, flights, uh, it's going to be anything between 3.75 for the 30 percent filling and 45 percent is going to have 2.54. For the river flights, we're going to have the range between 104, 137, and 1.62 for the 15, uh, 13 percent and 45 percent respectively. 
For the CF3 or the special conveyor mixing pedal capacity factor, usually we're going to have the standard pedals per pitch seat set is going to be 45 reverse pitch value. The CF3 factor is going to be either known if I'm going to have uh, one pedal and 1.32 if I'm going to have four pedals. And once again, I put the table <clears throat> the three table in full page so you can use it later for your design procedure. Now for the screw conveyor capacity. First we have to look at the material class code here. We have different material class code. We saw that in the table. Okay, so first we have to search for the material code and then we're going to check what will be the degree of the trough loading. 45 degree, 30% A, 30% B, and 15%. If I'm going to find this material, I'm going to check first what will be the flow rate manually by calculation. Then I will come to this table and try to find the one above the value I got. For example, if I calculated the maximum uh, capacity of the conveying, uh, to be uh, 2,150. So if I'm going to come to the table, I'm not going to choose the 2,025. I'm going to choose the 2,500. According to that, I will know what will be the diameter of the screw. I will find what will be the amount of the material, how many cubic feet per hour, I can transform per one RPM, this one. Then I'm going to calculate the actual number I have for the capacity, which was 2,100, divided by 62, and should give me the maximum RPM that should be less than 40. If it's okay, then I can use the 20 inches screw diameter. If not, I'm going to choose another number, like the 2,025. Repeat the same process. If I go going to get that my maximum RPM is going to be less than 45, then the 18 is going to be my design. And that's what we are going to see in the example we are going to cover soon. So the last column is the value of the C1, which is the amount of the material can be conveyed at one RPM of the screw movement. So, sorry, any questions? Okay, now for the component groups, because you remember that we may have the, uh, the, the material like for the trough and the cover, and the material of the trough and the cover will be variable thicknesses and variable, uh, what we call the gauge uh, value, uh, depending on the material I'm going to convey. So for the normal services, if the component group are going to be 1A, 1B, 1C, and we're going to have the regular flights and regular trough are going to be used. So depending on the diameter of the C crew and the coupling diameters, we're going to have different thicknesses or the gauge or inches for the troughs and the covers. So once again, for normal services, we're going to use regular flights and regular troughs. If I'm going to have heavy services, I'm going to use the regular flights and the heavy troughs. In the case of the extra heavy services, I'm going to use regular flights and the heavy troughs. So you can see that the thickness each time is going to be increasing depending on the material I'm going to convey. So again, I put these tables for you in large size, so you can use it in case if you would like to do a design for the work. Now, after selecting the diameter of the, of the screw and the type of the screw, we need to calculate the power required to move the material. So we start first with designing a horizontal uh, screw conveyor. Why? Because this will be the simple type and also it's going to have only two uh, components of the power need to be cal calculated. The first one 
is going to be the horsepower required to overcome the conveying fraction. We're going to have fraction between the material convey and the screw conveyor wall and the trough wall. And the other horsepower component is going to be the power required to transport the material at a specific rate. When we're going to have these two components, we can simply add them and we're going to have the total power required for the motor. So the equations required to calculate the horsepower are going to be the following. The first one, the HPF. When I'm going to have F here, that means this will be for the fraction related. M, this will be the material moving related. So the HPF is going to be equal to the L, which is total length of the conveyor, multiplied by the N, which is the RPM value, the operating speed of the RPM value, multiplied by the FD, which is going to be the conveyor diameter factor, multiplied by the FB, which is the hanger bearing factor, and this divided by 1 million. The power you are going to have here is going to be in HP horsepower. The HP for the material in moving is going to be equal to the C, which is the equivalent design capacity, multiplied by the length of the conveyor, multiplied by the W, which is the density, multiplied by the FF, which is the flight factor, multiplied by the FM, which is the material factor, multiplied by the FP, which is the uh, is it mentioned here? This is flight. This this is flight factor. Uh, the, the paddle factor. And later to calculate to add these two values, I'm going to use the following equation: the HP is going to be equal to the HPF plus the HPM multiplied by the factor FO, which is the power over load factor. This type of safety factor. If, if the power of the uh, again to find is going to be more than five uh, horsepower, again to consider the FO is equal to one. If it's going to be less, again to use 1.1 and divided by the efficiency. So the value for the FB, which is a bearing factor, can be found from this table. Depending on the group of the material, group of the components, sorry, uh, and we're going to have different bearing types. So you can see that the bearing factor is going to be different if I get to have the group A, or we're going to have the ball bearing type, the fly, uh, the, uh, the bearing factor is going to be equal to one. For the rabbit or the, the rabbit type or the bronze type, I'm going to use 1.7, because they're going to be pushes, not, not real bearings. If I'm going to use the wood type, usually this will be uh, prevented. That was all design thing. Uh, for the group C, I'm going to use the plastic. Uh, the value is going to be plastic, and the nylon is going to have the two for the FB. Uh, for the group D, the uh, chilled hard uh, iron or the hardened alloy sleeve, I'm going to have the FB value is going to be equal to 4.4. Now, for the screw diameter factor or the FD, this will be increasing as the diameter of the screw is going to be increasing. The flight factor or the FF, and uh, this will depend on the type of flight and the conveyor loading we are going to have. So for the type, for the standard type of flight, we are going to have the values going to be one for all type of the conveyor loading. For the type of the cut of flight, this will be starting from 1.1 for the 15%, 1.115 for the 30%, 1.2 for the 45%, and 1.3 for the 95%. And the same thing is going to be for the cut flow of the flights and for the recruitment of flights. Now, the pedal factor, the FB, depends on how many pedals we are going to have in our system. Now, remember that the pedals are the small pedals we're adding in between the screw uh, in order to achieve the mixing process. So, if I'm not going to have any pedals, the FB value is going to be equal to 1. One pedal, 1.29. For pedal 2.16. Now for the efficiency, we said that we cannot connect the motor directly to the shaft of the screw conveyor, because in that case the motor is going to be run at high RPM and doesn't have the enough torque to move the, the shaft. So we're using a speed reduction. 
usual speed reduction will increase the torque. I think you remember that from uh, uh, the machine design process. If I get to have a small gear rotating at very high speed or high RPM value, it's not, not going to have enough torque. So I'm going to use a larger gear connected to it. This larger gear will simply going to reduce the RPM value, but it's going to increase the torque because the length or the arm of the torque is going to be higher. Now, let's see what are the types of the speed reduction mechanism we have. V belts and the sheaves, the efficiency is 94%. Position roller chain or the cut tooth sprockets, sprockets uh, with the open guards, we're going to have 93%. The position roller chain or uh, the cut tooth sprocket with the oil tight casing, 94%. Single reduction helical or the heavy gun in a closed gear reducer or the uh, gear, meter, uh, gear motors is going to have 95%. Double reduction helical heavy uh, gun uh, in a closed, a closed sorry, gear reducer or the gear motors is going to have 95%. The triple reduction helical heavy guns or the a closed gear Reducer of the gear motors is going to be have 93%. We can have the low ratio in a closed warm gear speed reducer. We can have the medium ratio in a closed warm gear reducer. And we can have the uh, high, this actually a high ratio, high ratio uh, in a closed warm reducer is going to have 50% efficiency only. Sometimes we can have two of these reducers to be connected together. And that's what we're going to have in the next example. Now let's read this example. We have a conveyor to convey the bulk portless cement horizontally from the chute to the pin at a rate of 250 ton per hour. The distance from the center of the chute to the center of the pin is 30 meters. So we have two numbers in this question. The rate of the transportation and we have the distance we need to move the material uh, along. All the other parameters will be extracted from the property tables for the cement, bulk Portland cement. So I'll try to take a look at the table here and try to find the bulk cement. Uh, shall I look at the P? I will look at the P first. Portland cement. And then if I couldn't find it, I will go for the B. So B, B, O, R, Portland, Portland. I can make a search, but I'm too lazy to do that. P, O, R. Should be somewhere here. Okay, so I will look for cement with C. Okay. You can get closer. Ah, yeah, cement. So, cement Portland, this one. So, you can see that I'm going to highlight this one. Cement Portland. The density is 94. Uh, this is the code for the material, the CFA material code. The component is 2D, and the FF, which is the material, uh, the FM material factor is 1.4. Okay, so these are the parameters we have. We got the density, we got the component uh, uh, code, the 2D. And we have the FM value, which is the material factor, as 1.4. This is how to use this table, and we are going to see how we are going to continue with the design procedure. So we need to find the screw diameter, the RPM value required, and the drive power and the installed motor power required. So step number one, get any information of the conveying material. We found that the density, anything between 60 to 75. So it seems that I used a different table than this one when I made this question. The material code is 68. Yeah, this is not the Portland. 
actually I using here the ah uh, yeah sorry uh, from this table I got this one cement Portland while the irritated okay so this is the density this is the cold factor and this is the component factor code and this is the FM value Okay, sorry for that. So we use the irritated. Just let me check, read the question once again. Did we mention irritated or just uh, the partner cement? Ah, doesn't doesn't mention that. Sorry, sorry for this uh, inconvenience. Maybe I should add the irritated cement. Okay, material code is given. 2D is going to be the component series, and the 1.4 is the material factor. Now we are going to use this component to make our design. Now I'm 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 really sorry, but in this equation I use the the lower value for the density. In real life scenario, as a safety factor, we're using the maximum value for the density. Because the density is varying, it can be higher, it can be lower, it can be in between. So if I would like to design a system that can carry all the different density variations, I should do it with the maximum. So it's going to be able to do the minimum, the intermediate and the higher densities. So first we need to find the uh, equivalent irritated volume. So the density we have is 250 ton per hour. That's metric ton. Density we are going to use is going to be the 60 pound per cubic feet. So I would like to change that to how many cubic feet per hour we are going to convey. So first, we are going to change the Q value from ton per hour to pounds per hour. So this will be very simple. By using the uh, conversion factor we had earlier, we are going to multiply the Q of 250 metric ton to be in kilograms. I'm going to multiply it by 1,000. And then every one kilogram, contain 2.2046 pounds. OK, so that's to change it to pounds. That's to change it to kilograms from ton. So this one ton. Two kilograms. And this one kilograms. pounds. So I'm going to have that the material conveying should be at the rate of 5.5 .5 multiplied by 10 up to the power of 5 pounds per hour. Now I would like to calculate for higher value. So I'm going to use the overload capacity factor, which is type of the safety factor at range between 110% to 120%. Just give me one second. OK, so um, in that case, I'm going to use 110 percent. So instead of conveying 5.5 multiplied by 10 up to the power of 5, I'm going to multiply this value by 1.1. So I'm going to have higher value need to be conveyed. Now I need to find the conveying materials as a volume rate or how many cubic feet per hour because all our table we have it in cubic feet per hour. So of course, if I would like to change the volume flow rate, uh, sorry, the, the mass flow rate, the volume flow rate, I need to divide by the density. So the normal capacity or the QV in volume, is going to be equal to the Q in mass divided by the density. So if I get to divide the 5.5 .5 multiplied by 10 out to the power of 5 by 60, I will get the value of 9.167 multiplied by 10 out to the power of 3 cubic feet per hour. So we multiply it by the safety factor, and there's going to be 10,008, 10.08 uh, 10 multiplied by 10 out to the power of 3 cubic feet per hour is going to be the equivalent capacity. Now, I'm going to take this figure 
and I'm going to go to the charts and tables, try to find what would be the proper diameter for my design. So I'm going to go to the table, having the C value to be 10,080, and try to locate what would be the most proper uh, diameter for my screw. So 10,080 is located between these two figures. As I mentioned earlier, we start first by taking the higher value. So I will get the 10,300. That's mean that the diameter I'm going to have for my screw is a 20 inches. The C value or the C1 is going to be equal to 93.7 cubic feet per hour in one RPM of the screw movement. Now I would like to check if my selection was correct. So the other factor I'm going to check with is going to be the maximum RPM value of 110. So let's see how we're going to use it. The C1 is 93.7. So to check the RPM value, I'm going to divide the C of 10,080 by the C1 of 93.7. And I will get that the M value is going to be equal to 107.6 RPM. Now the maximum RPM I can have for the 20 uh, inches diameter is 110. So this one is going to be less than 110. So I can say that this is OK design. Now what's happened if not? I'm not going to use the 10,300. I will go for the 8,120. Review <coughs> the process and see how much we're going to get. Or go for the 16,400. It's just going to be about the iteration and the design procedure. Now, from the tables, we are going to find the FM, the density, the FD, okay, the the uh, the FB value for the group D, the FF for the standard flight, the FP for no paddles, the efficiency for the reducer efficiency, and the efficiency two for the V belt efficiency. We are going to use these parameters to find what will be the conveyor horsepower. So how we got that? First, uh, this is the density. OK, uh, we have the 2D for the component series. Using this 2D uh, to find for the group D, what will be the bearing factor? The FM factor is 1.4. The FD for 20 inches is 165. No paddles. The FE is one. We have the V belts and the sheaves, 95%. And we have the double reduction helical uh, uh, gear, meter, gear motors is going to have 94%. S the FF factor for the standard uh, flight and 45 degree, 45% 45 is going to be one. So I'm going to use these parameters to calculate uh, the horsepower. But before that, we need to know what will be the length of the screw I need to use. So the overall length screw must be greater than 30 because the distance we want to remove the material is 30 meters. So 30 meters, uh, we're going to use nine standard screw conveyor trough. Each one is going to have the length of 12 feet. So the standard trough is going to have 12 feet. Remember that you always need to do the design for the standard materials. If you would like to make something special for your design, this will cost you more money. So it's not going to be harmful to use the standard one, even if you're going to have more lengthy uh, screw conveyor trough, uh, rather than try to cut and make your special order. So the total length we're going to need is going to be 30 meter which is the original length, center to center length, divided by 0.3048. Uh, now, the 0.3 uh, 
048 is how many feet we have for one, six, uh, one uh, meter length. So the 30 meters is going to be equal to 98.43 feet. Now, if I get to use nine standard screw, uh, screw trough, each one is going to have 12 feet long. That means that the length now is going to be equal to 108 feet. And this equivalent length is more than the original length. So my selection is OK. Now I'll calculate the horsepower. First, the horsepower for the fraction. Now for this horsepower for a fraction, I'm going to use the length of 108 feet. The RPM value, the one we calculated, 107. The FD and the FB, the one we found from the tables, and we're going to get that the horsepower is going to be equal to 8.4 horsepowers. Now the horsepower required to move the material, we are going to use the C value, which is the flow rate of 10,080 cubic feet per minute, per hour, multiplied by the length, multiplied by the density. W here is the density. Multiplied by the fly factor, material factor, and the petal factor divided by 1 million. And this will give me 90.7 horsepower. The FO is going to be 1 for the case of the horsepower more than 5. It's going to be more if I'm going to have horsepower less than 5. So the horsepower now can be calculated to be the HPF plus the HM, HPM divided, multiplied by the FO divided by the efficiency. And this will be equal to 112. Remember that the efficiency here is going to be equal to 0.94 multiply by 0.94 because we have two reduction systems connected to each other. Each one have 94% efficiency. So to find the total efficiency, we need to multiply the efficiencies. So uh, in that case, we're going to have 112.2. We can change it to uh, what by multiply by 0.746. And this will be equal to 88.77 kilowatt. The largest nearest motor is going to be the 90 kilowatt, and this will be the one we are going to use. What I would like to do later is that you will take the figures we just presented on the previous page and put in this equation and try to find the same figures. Now for the torque. For the torque, we are going to use the following equation. The torque is equal to 63,025 multiplied by the horsepower divided by the RPM value. So the torque is going to be equal to 4.6 multiplied by 10 out to power 4 pounds inches. The MT value is going to be equal to the 716.2 multiplied by the horsepower divided by the N. And in the metric, we're going to have the value for the torque is going to be 523.13 gram per meters. Actually, you can multiply that by 9.81, and it's going to be in Newton meter. Now, the inclined screws are very popular. The inclined and the uh, vertical screws is going to have another component of the power, which is the power required to lift the material. So uh, this often is going to be desirable for using the inclined type or the vertical type uh, because it's going to cover the two operation with one piece of the equipment that can move and left at the same time. Standard screw conveyor will often get to operate normally up to 15 degree with only a small loss of the capacity. Beyond that, the adjustment and or modification are typically going to be necessary. The design for the inclined or the vertical type is going to require more horsepower because simply we are going to have some of the material will tend to go down due to the gravity. The screw need to take it up and thus is going to use more energy. The hangers should be eliminated in that case because they are going to create the dead flow area at the emphasized with the inclined conveyors. And this often going to be a result of the use of the longer screw, which requires their own design considerations. 
Other modification required again to be first, can't use the tight air clearance between the screw and the trough. Higher screw speed required, shorter pitch screw flighting, use the uh, tubular trough or the shrouds, and there are many variables involved in the, including all the products, particle size, shape, and the moisture content, and extra. The vertical conveyor size is going to be something similar to the uh, inclined one, but it's going to have even more power because this will need to lift it vertically, not even inclined. So usually the screw pitch is going to be smaller. We always going to use the circular trough, never use the U shape or the V type. So uh, the horsepower requirement for the inclined screw conveyor and the vertical screw conveyor is going to be uh, as following. First, the advantage of this system, inclined conveyor often is going to be desirable as it's going to may solve the conveying problem with the minimum equipment and occupy minimum spaces. This advantage is the capacity, where the maximum variable capacity of the given screw conveyor will decrease with the increase of the inclinations. So each time we are going to increase the inclination, the capacity of the system will be reducing. The horsepower per unit capacity will be also going to be increasing. So to calculate that, the height of the of the system, we need to apply it for the horsepower required to elevate the material. We need to know what will be the length of the screw conveyor, the length between the center to center. Simply I'm going to multiply the L by the sine of theta, I will find the value for the edge. As simple as that. Or if I know what the distance between the centers and I know the height, I can find the length of the screw conveyor by dividing the length between the distance uh, by the uh, tangent of the theta, I will find the L. Sorry, by the cosine of the theta, I will find the L. So the horsepower required to lift the material is going to be equal to the C, which is the capacity, multiplied by the density, multiply by the actual height, all in feet, divided by 3, 33,000, multiply by 60. And then we're going to add it to the total power, I'm going to add it as a component between the uh, two uh, arrows. Now uh, the HPH is going to be horsepower to lift the material in horsepower, see the equivalent design capacity. H is the actual height of the left and uh, feet, and uh, the E is the drive efficiency. I don't think I have an example for that now. And also, I want to catch up with the uh, uh, the revision, which is going to be start in 15 minutes. So, problem associated with the inclined screw conveyor. First, several things can be done to overcome the many of the problem we have associated with the inclined screw conveyors. First, limit the use of the standard screw components or to an incline of the less than 25%. So usually try not to use it over 15%. So our design, we're going to do it with the 45%. Use the close uh, clearance between the trough and the screw. Increase the speed over that the applicable for the horizontal screw conveyor of the same size. Use a short pitch screw value of two over three or one over two pitch value. Uh, now, the other types of the screw feeders, which we call the live buttons, and I think I covered that in the uh, feeder uh, lecture uh, uploaded earlier, which was recorded one. I doubt that anyone actually watched the video. Screw converters are going to be used to control the feed rate of the free-flowing materials from the pin or the hooper. The inlet section of the trough is going to be designed to be flooded with the material, so it's going to be 100%. The uh, shroud, which is going to be the, cover, uh, the curved cover, or the tubular trough will help the restrict of the floated area to only at the inlet of the section, and then it's going to go to 45 or even 15%, 13, 15%. The screw under the inlet and sometimes the trough as well are going to be modified to convey the metered amount of the material per revolution of the screw. The modification may include the changes in the flighting diameters, the pitch, pipe diameters, and the trough shape, and extra. 
The screw with uniform diameter and the pitch will convey the materials from the rear of the inlet opening first, and this can create the flow issue with the sum of the materials because only portion of the materials and the inlet is going to be actually used, so the pin and the hubble doesn't discharge evenly. The pockets of the material do not move and may clump, and this will degrade over the time. And this will require the screw with the variable pitch flighting, as we mentioned. It's going to be table shape at the beginning, different diameters, different uh, distance between which value between the screw in order to uh, keep the process of the flow continuously. Like what we have in this example, you can have the single screw feeders, can have a variable which is value. You can see they are going to be short and the value is going to be increased as we go into the end. Because this area is going to be fully floated and later is going to reduce gradually until the end. We can have the tapered diameter, and this is going to enhance the flow of the materials to fill uh, the rest of the screw. We can have the cone screw, and this will push the material that's going to have a more resistant to, to move. Usually the cone screw is going to add the pressure from this side toward that side, and this will push the material and make it flow through the rest of the conveyor. We can have the twin screw feeders, we can have the multiple screw feeders, or what we call the live bottom. And that's actually what we use to empty the, the silos. Okay, M multiple screws going to move together, make a live bottom or live earth, and thus it's going to uh, move the materials by adding some vibration forces, and thus we can empty the silo totally. Okay, so once again, the next lecture is going to be about the bucket elevator. We are going to arrange how to meet uh, uh, in the week after the the Easter uh, holiday, Easter Monday, and uh, we're going to meet maybe for one hour just to talk about the bucket elevator. Because as I told you, this will be part of the assignment number five, which will be the last assignment. And uh, I don't think that we need to wait for another three weeks to meet once again. Maybe we can meet in two weeks and talk briefly about the bucket elevator, then we're going to go with the technology uh, as we can. So I would like to give you 10 minutes of break before we're going to start the revision. Uh, during that, I'm going to prepare the slides for uh, the revision, which is going to be the last tutorial.